So our special guest on this episode is Graham Hardy, Principal of Hardy Finance Corporation. You've been a property developer, you've been a commercial real estate investor, you've had hospitality ventures, and, and you're also a private investor. So welcome to the program and, and look forward to sharing your journey. Let's start from the top, if we could. As I understand it, you were born in Perth and attended Wesley College. Tell us a, a little bit about your background, if you could. Okay. Um, uh... I'm born in Western Australia. Uh, I suppose uh, my parents got divorced when I was uh, six, seven years of age, so uh, raised by my mother, which sounds like an Albanese sort of story, which is terrible, but uh, 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 myself, my brother, my father's business had gone broke and that broke up their marriage, so I end up uh, living in a little beach house down in, uh, in between the refinery and Rockingham. Went to East Rockingham Primary School for a couple of years, and out of the blue, uh, my mother won £3,000 in lottery, would you believe? And with that money, she uh, bought a house in South Perth and put myself and my brother through Wesley College, which is how I got my education, as thankfully, to a lottery win. Uh, then, uh, going through Wesley, I enjoyed that. To get to university, I did a, got a teacher training college scholarship, and uh, that put me through university, majoring in mathematics, because they wouldn't let me do what I really wanted to do, which was commerce. and. Uh, after doing finished my uh, Bachelor of Arts and I was doing my dip ed year, I was playing football with Perth and state tennis. I got caught up for national service under the conscription in uh, Vietnam back in 67. Uh, I left the education department, uh, stopped playing football, went from the medical and out of the blue, uh, they sent me to an orthopedic surgeon up in West Perth because I had my ankle strapped and it was because of, uh, it turned out I had truncated spurs in my ankle and I was classified mentally unfit for the army. So I was out of the education department, out of the army, and not sure what to do. And my mother was working as a bookkeeper uh, under a firm of chartered accountants at a C-class hospital. And one of the partners of that firm said, perhaps Graham would like to be a chartered accountant. So I went and joined the firm. I loved it from day one, used correspondence, and we, uh, finished it in two and a half years became a tax partner there and that's where we changed to a vocation which I really enjoyed, which was finance and uh, accounting. Mm. So if I'm not mistaken, this would have been sort of the early to mid 70s or uh, uh, Yes, it was um, 1973 I became a partner of the firm. I stayed as a partner for the firm for eight years uh, and then uh, during that period of 73 to 80, 81, I diversified into so many different industries that uh, something had to give and the most demanding was uh, chartered accountancy with every 10 minutes record in that and people who uh, you'd find that your clients are ringing up at midnight and I think this, this new uh, law about uh, no ringing after hours would have been beautiful in my days. It didn't turn out to be that but so I stayed there as a partner in 81 and then I left in 81 to uh, follow all the individual companies I created while I was a partner always through finding the right person for the right position. So I'd link up with a, a person who I knew had a lot of ability, they had good ideas and they wanted to have someone to either finance them, organise them and plan expansion. And that's what I enjoyed most of all was going through a whole series of industries with people, an individual who's an expert in every single field. So in real estate, I did that myself primarily in newspapers, a guy called Simon Hadfield, who was the editor of the Western Mail for Robert Holmes Accord. With that, we bought all the suburban newspapers, community newspapers, took them public. Uh, and uh, transport, a guy called Jim Temple, who's a good friend. Uh, Temple Freights was a small transport company I got involved. By the time I, uh, we sold out, we'd got one WA Company of the Year in 1983. One side was uh, Bank West, the other side was West Farmers Window, so we're in good company there. They had grown from only 20 odd trucks to over 100, 80 acres of industrial land, large, the biggest container depot outside the city. So I just loved that growth pattern, but then we ended up selling out to a big company, which is what happens with most things I did. So I spent, and then on hospitality, uh, which is an area I love uh, very much so, usually on the right side of the bar, not on the wrong side. And I've always enjoyed that part of hospitality. And a chap called Bill Oddie, 1979, we started our first venture together in uh, Northbridge. And since then, we've had 30 different venues uh, uh, since that time. 
Let's talk about that first menu, Eagle One nightclub, nightclub in 1979 with, with Bill. What did you like about the hospitality business and how did you get your, your foot in the door with that first venture? Um, I suppose um, it was just purely the association uh, with Bill Oddie. He had, I love people who are very creative and see something and love giving good service, uh, using imagination. And uh, this was happened to be a, a it came out, he'd, he'd had a business which he'd sold out of, he's finding something to do. The opportunity to start a new nightclub came up. And uh, Eagle One is obviously named after the, um, the American module that landed on the moon, first module that landed on the moon. So that was primarily the reason. As soon as we started that, it went very, very well. And from that, with Bill in charge of that section, we just kept on expanding till we had a whole series of venues and kept on expanding, some of them which we held for a long time. Uh, Hannibal's Nightclub, which a lot of the people in Perth would remember if they got grey hair or white hair, is um, we bought the 1983 opening night. Um, in those days, uh, we were very close to Coca-Cola and the tab girl was Elle McPherson. And so we end up uh, on the night we purchased the property and settled. We flew Elle McPherson and her mother. Elle was only 18 at the time. And we've had to fly her mother and their young baby across, her mother's baby across, and gave her a very, very first ever uh, paid uh, uh, job, I suppose you call it. And that night, on the opening night, there was over 2,000 people lined up because she was the tab girl in the red bikini pouring a bucket of uh, ice over guys on the beach and went ballistic. And then so, and she, within a year, she was in New York City. Uh, on a $10,000 a day assignment. We didn't pay anywhere near that. But uh, she was a delightful person to deal with and we still see her when she comes to Perth. She's still got an association going back because we gave her a first paid job way back in 1983. You mentioned when you're a, a tax partner and you're working as an accountant, this idea of investing in other ventures and, and backing people. What did you look for when you were backing people, whether it was in hospitality, whether it was in property, or whether it was in some of those other ventures, uh, newspapers that, that you were mm. involved in? Uh, yes, you, you can, uh, two things. Uh, AI, I knew the people very, very well from university days or associates. I knew their character, a lot of them I played sport with, but I could see that they understood their industry and they were very, very good at it. For instance, the paper industry, Simon Hatfield was, um, high up in WA newspapers when Robert Holmes of Court picked him to set up the Western Mail for him, which was competing with uh, the Western Australian Sunday Times. And his school there was very, very great. So you find people that sort of school set level. Bill Oddie, his uh, father was a publican for 28 years. Bill was born in a hotel and it was in his blood. But also he had that extra ingredient which people need to have a a charisma where people respect him and had the ability to see the future of their industry. So if they told me the future of the industry, then I could see that. I had a farming partner, my tennis partner from school days and afterwards, Henry Laidman from Katanning, a very established farming family for many generations. And with his uh, uh, association uh, as an investment, we bought a thousand acre farm down south and gradually went up to 4,000 acre farms in South West till we had, um, we sold the 4,000 acres and bought a 40,000 acre farm in Queensland from elders who were, John Alley and IXL just taken over of elders and they had 10 stations up the East Coast. He was selling them at any price at all. And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, uh, get one which, um, the 40,000 acres with 20,000 the Collinsville Marinos on it, 2,000 cattle. But it was in the worst drought of all times. And uh, the thing I liked about those sort of things is how do you solve the problems of what was there? They were hand feeding the uh, sheep and cattle and bringing water. What we did was that we bought two Steiger tractors from Cambellum, which was a failed cotton project up in the Ord River. Took them over top of Australia, put in 3,000 acres of crop, had a good year, but we didn't sell any, we put all the crop into storage, big facility silos. Uh, that gave us feed guaranteed, it matter what the seasons were like going forward. And to solve the water problem, BHP had the gas wells on the site and two of their bores hadn't struck gas but were pumping out hot water you could cook eggs in, it was that hot. 
crystal clear. So we bought the casing off them and then built dams around these two bores and that gave us an unlimited water supply coming out of the ground, which made the place a farm impervious to any sort of uh, drought or otherwise. So. I want to ask you about Perth and, and Western Australia in the 80s and 90s. Mm. You're also involved in so many of these ventures. Tell us about the, the business environment at the time. As everybody knows, there are so many larger-than-life figures here in Perth. But what was it like being in on the ground during, during that time? Uh, unbelievably exciting. No, I think that uh, I would have been uh, late 30s to early 40s during that real crazy period when W Inc. was on and the state was booming. And I think it was just fascinating. I was very lucky to uh, be asked to join the Young Prisons Organisation. And on that group, there's only 30 in Western Australia, but they're all entrepreneurial people from your Bond to Connells to Multiplex, you name it, all of them were there. And every month you'd meet a round table and uh, us being there and seeing the size of the deals that were going on, like a billion dollars to buy a Channel 9 or build a casino with Dallas Dempster. Those guys were characters who had no fear. And uh, I learnt so much from not only their success, but also their failures. A lot of them uh, had bad endings only because uh, Interest rates went to 19% or where it might have been in 1990. The stock market crashed in 87. So I learned a huge amount on both sides of the coin. I learned a lot of that primarily from my days as a chartered accountant where our firm was the biggest insolvency firm in Perth. We did most of the big liquidations in insolvency. So I was the tax partner. And under the um, requirement at that stage, every company who went broke or individual had to have a tax return repaired so the Australian government could find out how much tax they had preferential rights. So I had the ability to see some really good clients who were developing and successful and also the ones who failed. And I could see that blend gave me a balance because uh, being involved, in, especially in YPO, the emotion was everyone was doing deals like it was going out of fashion. Four on the floor, they used to say, you know, raging like mad. So I really enjoyed it immensely. And, the people there, you'd never get the same experience because of Perth's isolated nature, especially back in the 1980s, was very small. And the business community knew each other. So there was no, everything knew what was happening. And that taught you an awful lot. Just on the accountancy background that you've got, what were some of the mistakes that you saw some of those businesses that you were involved in make? And, and how have you positioned your businesses in the past and, and today to not make those same mistakes? Um, I think the... The biggest one of all is that most companies got into trouble because they had no idea where they were going. They were a cash flow sort of business. Like they'd, if they had cash to buy something, they'd spend it. And when the creditors come up for payments, so it really became to lack of financial knowledge that they, and they're not accepting the reality of what their business was like. And invariably, I think out of 100% of uh, businesses we liquidated, that I'd say 96% were companies which uh, had bad records and they tried to survive on cash flow, which uh, you couldn't do. But the other thing I suppose was that um, uh, the banking industry in those days was a lot, lot different as today. They went absolutely berserk with cash in the 80s. You could borrow money at the drop of a hat and people did. But then when they started to tighten, uh, they just put everyone to the sword so that they closed down. I think Westpac made a provision of about two point something billion dollars in the property in this part of the property. Whereas they had to work with the people who had done those developments, they would have halved their loss, they end up being saved by AMP. But effectively, the banks have learnt a lot from that and now they tend to be much more able to work people things out rather than just be cutthroat and put everybody under, which they did then. So I learnt a lot there in that period. I think my conservatism which I hadn't, is part of my, uh, I've got two sides to me. The conservatism maybe uh, hang back a bit on some of because the opportunities were huge in that 80 period. There was a deal coming across your desk every single day of the week. And uh, it, all you do is make sure you pick over half of them right. <laughs> Let's talk about the growth of your hospitality business, entertainment enterprises. You started with Eagle One nightclub in, mm. in 79, and then you had Hannibal, Savannah, and Arcadia in those early years. What, what were the fundamentals to providing a great hospitality experience? Um, I think um, being uh, one of the delights was that is traveling the world 
seeing what the trends were, like whether you go to London, New York or anywhere at all, seeing what's working. And I think that's what you bring back. And also ensuring that what you put to the people was far more than they expected. You put a lot more into the, the product at the very, very front end. And so a lot of people do places which look run down and grungy, but if you do it really well and put the money into it, only based upon what's happening around the world, that's where you find uh, your success comes. It's really understanding the marketplace and then giving it more than what they expect. And just on that, I saw it quite wherein you said, everyone comes out and they're here for a good time. There is no adverse feeling and that's why I like the industry more than anything else. What are the fundamentals to delivering on those customer expectations? So delivering a, a, a beyond what they expect experience, but, but what else? Um, I think most probably, uh, most of the time it starts at your front door, it's having the right sort of security. So if you have the, if it's a safe venue, and we've always focused all our businesses on uh, being attractive to females and uh, having, if they feel safe there, the guys are gonna follow anyway. So if you get the place where uh, it's suitable for women and men, at that level, it's a safe environment. That's the first criteria you make up. And once you've done that, then it comes down to service, product. Entertainment's very important. We've had uh, such huge amount of entertainment go through our venues. We had the village people live on stage at Eagle One Nightclub, which is hard to imagine they have a, how famous they were at the time. Yeah, but every single Australian artist uh, was present in nightclubs. Nowadays, that can't happen. The cost of putting on a show is so, so astronomical. They need a Optus Stadium or MCG to be able to cater for the big stars. But we had some fantastic artists and that was part of what you gave people back in those days and gave you a real lift. As I understand it, the portfolio has evolved from those initial legacy venues to encompass some newer offerings, including Rambler on Swan, Empire Bar and Tiger Lills. Talk to me about some of the changes that you've seen in terms of consumer preferences over the years. Yes, um, I think it's, it, it definitely changed. The, the, the people of today are far more sophisticated in their tastes that uh, invariably uh, back in those days, the choices were Benny Moselle, white wine, a swan lager, and maybe occasional spirit drink, but that was what was there and was the way people did it in those days. The consumption per person has dropped dramatically and their taste buds have gone up so they tend to buy, uh, appear to pay more for a really good drink rather than just um, uh, volume. So I think it's been more selective now. Cocktails, are obviously you see in places now, I never knew a cocktail back in those days. So things have changed so dramatically in the product that's been delivered and it's now more of a, um, a social environment uh, and a different sort of atmosphere the nightclub industry as such is so limited now through laws and everything else, even though it's still a highly profitable industry. Uh, I don't think there's been a nightclub issued, license issued in Perth the last 15 years or so, which means that the thing has changed. So time of leaving venues is much earlier. The safety aspects are far more important. And I think that people now are more discerning and uh, they still want to be entertained. Uh, we do the ice cream factory pop up with a, a promoter during uh, December, and that's 13 nights this last year, in December last year, with an average of about four to five thousand people per uh, evening. And that's a clear indication that there's a demand for it of getting together, as long as it's got the entertainment aspect of it, and it's a, it's just an evolving industry where now before those things wouldn't happen. You might have a few rages out in the bush with that sort of style of thing, but <laughs> you wouldn't get away with it nowadays, and I think effectively that's what's happening. You're a pioneer in the hospitality industry, and more recently you've reinvented yourself, like you said, with some of these pop-up and, and sort of activation spaces with um, the Ice Cream Factory. How does something like that come about, and where do you see that uh, is going to be positioned long-term in, in terms of personal and life future? Um, I think most probably how it came around in our case is that we've got a property over in Northbridge which uh, takes its name from the ice cream factory. It used to be Peter's Ice Cream Factory for a decade, almost a century. It's a very large site and uh, we had a big area which was un unutilised and the promoter came to us, a very smart two guys. One's a lawyer and one's a financial guy, not coming from the industry but had good ideas. 
and so they put the ideas together and effectively evolved from a, uh, an invitation to use the site once a year. It's a redevelopment site. We can, it's 14,000 square metres. We can put in just under 60,000 square metres of net level area on it. It's a long-term development project. In the interim time, the ice cream factory pop-up once a year is a fantastic way of generating uh, income for the holding costs, which includes things like land tax and rates and taxes. And uh, it's interesting. So the, the first chapter of your career and, and what many people will know you by is from your hospitality background, but you've been equally as successful in commercial real estate investment and development. Firstly, what attracted you to this area? And tell us about some of the projects that, that you see as okay. great achievements. Mm. I think uh, uh, I've always had a fundamental love of property you know, and development. And I started with a single house in Floriot Park and went through about six houses. In those days, there was no capital gains tax, so therefore, you can, and inflation was quite, always 8 to 10%, so you're always guaranteed of a, a good profit, no tax. So it enabled you to create and grow very quickly. And uh, I think the most important thing I had was that being a partner with firm of chartered accountants with a high income, my credibility with lenders was such that I could borrow money where the majority of people wouldn't have been able to. And the lenders were far, we'd look at that aspect as much as anything else. So from that small start with houses, which I did well as chartered accountants, I then started to look at uh, what I thought the future was going to be. And I've always gone for large sites. I've never done, I've done developments where it's only a small block of land, which you might have to go 20 storeys to make it work. I tend to, this one here in South Perth is 7,000 square metres. North Bridge is 14, Empire is 14,000 square metres. So with that much, the land is the value. At the end of the day, the land is the value. Everything else really, to some extent, is relevant for income producing, but all of them have a lifespan. But the fundamental is property, is the value of the land on which you're upon. And the bigger the land area you have in the right locations, the more chance you have of success going forward. You've focused uh, predominantly on commercial real estate investment, office towers. Mm. You've shied away from residential and, and some other sectors. What do you like about office that, that perhaps you don't like about some of the other sectors? Okay, I suppose fundamentally office space is that you do something, particularly office space, I do retail and office and parking, is that uh, office space, when you lease it, it's either five or seven years, you've got a tenant with a, a good pedigree paying rent for that period of time, it's set and forget. And I think the same with retail to a great extent. Location's important, whereas you take something like residential, if you do a development with, say, 50 apartments and you sell half of them, then you really are in trouble because you don't make any profit until you get the last five or ten sold. And uh, dealing with something I don't like about um, residential is that if you've got 50 apartments and while you're building them, you end up with 50 wives who all want different ideas and different things, and that doesn't, doesn't grab me very much. So. Whereas a commercial property, you do a deal, it's done, finished and put to bed. Let's talk about some of those deals that you've done. So this office here, 7,000 square metres in South Perth and Empire and some of the others, how did they come about and how did you get the finance and, and the fundamentals right to be able to deliver a great product? Okay, this one here in South Perth, uh, I bought, I put, put the land under option back in 1986 from a, a Malaysian investor who had been knocked back on uh, part of his development. It was at that stage an amp old garage here in the front part. The front third of the block was an amp old garage. The back half of the block had been sheep poled by multiplex, it was just a big hole in the ground. Uh, about 10 developers had tried to make something work, but the secret was the amp old garage. Amp old, uh, used to be the busiest petrol station because when the Narrows Bridge was built, the only way to get onto the Narrows Bridge was to go along down Ben Street, along the foreshore, and up onto the Narrows Bridge and put the on-ramp on, it became the worst petrol station. And that's when I came into the party. So how you, and no one else could still make it work. And how I made it work was I went to the, took an option over the land, went and saw the operator of the uh, sub lessee of the um, uh, petrol station. I offered him a couple hundred thousand for business doing no trade whatsoever, maybe a couple of gallons of petrol a day and a bit of repair work. And so he couldn't jump quick enough. Then I went and saw the state manager of Ampol and said, I'm now your tenant. Uh, I'm going to be here for as long as you want me to be, but I, uh, we're not going to make any, no one's going to make any money out of it. What would you take to buy, uh, me to buy your out of the head lease? 
and they could put a price on the table and that they, I accepted it. That gave me the whole site unencumbered. And in those days, that was in 86, unions were out of control in that period of time and the strikes were um, all along the time. So <coughs> I as an individual couldn't take the risk of getting this, thing, this building three quarters finished and have a stoppage, which they used to do a lot of. So John Roberts from Multiplex, which is a fantastic builder, I gave him the contract on the basis I paid nothing uh, till the thing had been approved by a final practical certificate of the architect came through. And that was backed up by my bank giving a guarantee for the finished product. And so he could draw down from his bank against that bank guarantee, but it meant that I paid nothing and the building was done in record time because Multiplex had the capacity to handle the unions where I couldn't. And when it's finished, in January 1990, uh, that's when my hair went white, interest rates were 19.5 per cent and all came down on one day on the 21st of January 1990. I'll never forget that day. All of a sudden, uh, you think of 19.5 per cent uh, interest rates. What we're seeing nowadays is uh, it's lovely. Just uh, in, in terms of managing the portfolio of assets over that time, how have you been able to weather some of those economic storms, whether it was 91 or whether it was the dot-com crash or the GFC? How have you been able to ensure that you're not over-leveraged? Over uh, well, I suppose in 1990, I was over-leveraged. Uh, uh, I physically, all those property assets, um, I mentioned earlier on that the banks were ruthless back in those days, but... Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to understand finance well enough and I took out interest rate swaps which uh, brought the interest rate down by about 5 or 6% over a five year period. They then worked in my favour so I went to the bank and closed out my, asked to close out my interest rate swap which was going to bring quite a few millions of dollars back. I'd, I was in the money you might call it. I would go back to floating rates but I had a lot of cash available. Uh, what I also did was that uh, the farm I'd bought in Queensland, 40,000 acres, uh, I got an offer for that because farming was going quite well there from the biggest dairy producer in New South Wales. He wanted he used to milk his cows three times a day on a circular platform. He ended up uh, wanted an offshoot for when he milked his cows till they had, before he sold them in the market. We had a water, we had feed and 40,000 acres. So I sold that to him in January 1990 and that cash the property was unencumbered, had a, a, a cash pile to survive that crash. The other thing I'd, I'd always done was to have things like the hospitality businesses where there's a constant cash flow. And uh, I've always had the freeholds associated with the, the, the businesses, but the cash flow from the uh, hotels and restaurants and clubs was sufficient to be able to have a cash flow to be able to pay things as it fell due. Uh, if you're just purely a property investor, you really are very exposed. You need a cash source because you can end up uh, not having tenants, uh, no uh, interest rates go to the roof. Those things are out of your control, whereas the cash flow and everything else from operating businesses with its hotels and that is always a safeguard. When you're looking to pursue a, a new development, you mentioned you like to look for large land sites and, and quality locations, but, but what are some of the other characteristics that you look for? Um, Fundamentally, look at the market, see what the market's providing, and also sticking purely to what you're comfortable with and what you've got a ability in. And my ability's always been in office, retail and parking. It's a very simple thing which I know very well. So therefore, when I look at something like that, with office space, you can pre-lease it before you put a brick on site. You can find a major tenant. So you can de-risk the project from day one by doing that. The building costs you can't control, and that's what's hurt a lot of people in the last uh, three or four years with uh, the inflation and the cost of building. That's been the biggest single destroyer where they've got fixed price contracts. It's okay for an investor if you've got a fixed price contract, but for the people doing it, they've been uh, sacrificed against high interest rates and the cost of buying supplies. Looking ahead over the, the long term, where do you see opportunities for investment, either privately or, or you know, through some of your commercial real estate um, In my particular case, uh, uh, I've got three adult children. My son's an architect, does all our developments up to DA approval. Uh, my daughter's a uh, eldest daughter. She's a, a financial uh, girl with commerce and uh, she's a qualified director. She knows that side of it. So I see them 
running a race of their own. We don't, I don't believe in succession plans. It's something which people throw down their throat all the time, get over succession plans. Well, maybe it's when I'm carried out the door or maybe it's a, a time when I think I've done enough, but I've got another conference in the, uh, my family that uh, we work well as a family. We all work in the same businesses. And I've always given and myself and my wife, I've got my 50th anniversary coming up next week, 50 years of marriage, which is quite remarkable. But we've made um, the kids independently wealthy from us, or in, not in wealthy in the terms that they've got enough assets in their own name, which we've transitioned transist to them over years, so they can do their own thing if they want to. So if any of them want to do something totally different, they could do it tomorrow, and they've got the, their own bankroll behind them. But effectively, because of that sort of attitude, and I think also the same, I think one of the reasons for longevity in marriage is that one of my good mates gave me advice that you've got to give your wife the runaway from home or divorce lawyer money because if you give that to them, they'll never spend it. So therefore, you're pretty well safer in the marriage going forward. <laughs> it has worked. <laughs> Geographically, when you look across Perth and, and the West more broadly, where do you see opportunities for growth? Where, where are you seeing the, the suburbs or areas or regions that are growing most rapidly that that you're looking at deploying capital either now or into the future? Undoubtedly, um, we're maturing as a city here now, and the closer you are to the CBD, the greater chance you have of success and the escalation in prices. We've had this uh, whole system of going up the coast both directions to the extent now that it's a long way from Yanship to Perth or Mandra to Perth. That infill's been happening there, but the main pressure now because of infrastructure cost is to finalise, get people close to the city. So I see the advantage of buying properties close to the city. That's where you're going to get your biggest improvement. Just It's a worldwide trend. You can't uh, avoid seeing it in any major city. And we've come to a fruition that uh, I can look out the window here when 1990 we did the leasing brochure. There wasn't a high rise building from the town hall down to the causeway. And same with the high rise building that we've now started to build. We've had some progressive uh, work done, Elizabeth Key and that Optus Stadium. So we're maturing as a city now. So the opportunities are to buy close to the city. If you buy there, residential especially, is going to be more and more uh, favourable. I think the mining industry, I don't think people underestimate how important the mining industry is, both for state government and federal government. And we're so wealthy, we haven't even scratched the surface of our wealth. And with technology now, advancing so much with detection equipment and, and sophisticated ways of finding minerals, which most of them are under, under cover now because all the easy ones have been, low hanging fruits being picked. But now it's going to keep on developing more and more. And I think that as the world progresses, whether it's an electric application or otherwise, our natural wealth is always going to be in our mining industry and that'll always create a boom in Perth. And we're go going through one at the moment, which has started to peter a little bit, but we've had a fantastic run with some unbelievable success stories. What's keeping you busy and active on the real estate front at the moment? Where are you you're deploying capital um, at the moment? Uh, primarily in, in, in development approvals. I think the market's not there at the moment and the uh, people who develop because they think they have to develop end up, end up in problems. So you've got to be conscious of timing as much as anything else. So location's important, but timing is even more critical because if you pick the wrong cycle of time, you can end up getting your fingers badly burnt. And that's pretty evident at the present time with the cycle at the moment. But that'll change. And in some stage in the next, uh, uh, I'd say, five years, it'll be a totally different market again. And Western Australia is a boom and bust place, but we've got the underlying, uh, underlying uh, strength in our mining industry, which occupies so much of the, uh, uh, of the um, wealth. And you've got people like oil and gas, Rio, you're mining people, Fortescue, the amount of wealth they're creating and they like to be centred in Perth because their assets are in Western Australia, that really gives a complete uh, underlying security for what you do in Perth. It must be said that you've also got a number and held a number of directorships throughout your career, including as a non-executive director of Peel Mining. What are you seeing in the, in the mining space here? You mentioned that it's starting to peter out a little bit. How much longer does that boom have to go? And what are some of the new innovations that are keeping that, that industry so strong? Um, I think it's really whether or not the electrification uh, is going to be 
real or not and how quickly they can get there. There's been a decline in EV sales and everything else far below what they expected to do. And uh, I think the things like lithium, which was went to eight and a half thousand dollars a ton now to eight hundred and fifty dollars a ton, that sort of sacrifice is because supplies come on from all around the world. So unless you, if you're in the products which are hard to find, like copper uh, and zinc and those which are not abundant, and you have to really take a, in a long long lead time, the, the, those are the industries which I think are going to be uh, where you'll make your money progressively. The iron ore industry relies so much on China and how much they build. And the Chinese are looking at Africa now in huge projects there that that'll become more competitive time goes on. But we're still uh, a fantastic place for raw materials exporting. I don't see uh, Western Australia or Australia being a down the line manufacturer. It's never been, been tried with BHP with the iron briquettes, with $3 billion investment lasts about a year and a half. It's so hard with our cost of uh, wages and everything else to be able to compete worldwide with the other nations which have a low cost of uh, production and wages. Just on the EV pace, I think it's like one or one and a half percent of new car sales in Australia mm. and, and maybe a little bit more than that in the US, but people don't seem to want them. It's that the range anxiety that everybody was talking about a few years ago. It's not that, it just seems that people just aren't interested in them. Why do you think that is and, and what impact do you think that will have on lithium miners? Obviously, there's so much need for lithium mm. in, in other devices and uses, but is the EV sort of revolution overblown, do you think, and, and why? Um, I think uh, the, what will change it, I think, being a tool, at the moment, the price of their vehicles and what you're getting, if you compare a EV vehicle, a Tesla, I'm not, I shouldn't use the name maybe, but Tesla, the car itself is not a glamour car. It's a fundamental car, very expensive with a batteries which there's articles have been written that after seven years you replace all the batteries in the car and that constitutes almost half the price of the car. So you could be looking at half the price of a car in seven years time. So that realisation is there. And secondly, the charging when in a state like Western Australia we go travel long distances, there's not the charging facilities. And there was an interesting article in one of the papers in the Eastern States, a, a drive from Melbourne to Sydney two identical cars, one diesel, one uh, EV, and end up costing exactly the same because the charging stations on the way charge, quite a, public ones are charging so much money for charging your car up. It, unless you charge at home, then it's becoming expensive, the same level. And you've got an asset which people think in seven years time, it's gonna be very expensive to keep on the road. So that, that'll improve as time goes on. But at the moment, the still seen as experimental in my opinion, and uh, China's bringing a lot onto the market and they'll bring the price right down and then as they get better at something, which they, at the moment they're still having low recalls and that sort of thing, with that sort of factor, uh, I think it's inhibiting the growth of the market. In terms of the business environment and, and landscape here in Western Australia, how strong is it? How strong is the is the mining sector and, and some of these other sectors which are beginning to become a sort of cornerstone foundations of the, the state's success? Um, I'd say it's it's very stable. Uh, we're very fortunate if you look at the amount of revenue. Our state government has surpluses of five to six billion dollars a year, purely through mostly royalties and the GST top up we get nowadays. So our state is so well insulated on those two aspects, and they account for so much money. Plus, you've got the big companies here. It flows through the whole way down the line. We really haven't noticed the same effect as say. Sydney and Melbourne, Melbourne especially, where the hospitality was devastated during the COVID period. We had a situation where we didn't get grossly, we got locked up for border lockup, but not business lockup. So we were able to survive much better than what uh, most other places were. We, in hospitality, we only closed down for three months in total. Whereas in Melbourne, they had 270 days a year being locked up. Well, that puts you so far behind when you start. and. Uh, We've always got a, and there's money in the pocket of people here because the wage level here, especially with the amount of fly in, fly out, it's, it's a very high income. Same with the uh, with shortage of labour, so therefore all the trades are getting a huge amount of money they never got. One stage it was five dollars a brick, it's there. it used to be about dollar eighty. It's settled in, <coughs> it's settled in around about um, three dollars a brick now, three dollars fifty, but that's three to twice as much as they were getting four or five years ago. So. 
that flows through the whole economy. What's missing in terms of infrastructure or tax reform or policy reform, do you think? Um, in general, in Australia-wide? Uh, here in the West. In the West. Yeah. Um, I think we've got a government, it's a no-risk government, and not prepared to uh, uh, be an invader of any great extent, so that, that won't change. That uh, We possibly have the highest payroll tax level in Australia. Our stamp duty is possibly the highest on housing. That sort of attitude, I think, is probably it's going along so well that they're not going to rock the boat with anything controversial. So I don't expect much change here in the West uh, under the current. And you've got a government where the Labor government controls, I think it's 52 seats out of 60. Uh, Liberals have got two seats and the Country Party's got three. So you've got five against uh, 50 odd seats in Parliament and they control the upper house as well. So therefore there's no way that they have to answer to anybody at all in a real combative parliamentary situation. So therefore there's no need to do anything at all because they know they're in control, but at least another election as well. 50 years of marriage next week and 50 <laughs> plus years of uh, business experience. What have been the, the key ingredients, do you think, to your success both professionally and, and personally? Well, I think there's probably, if I go to the personal one first of all, is that uh, uh, when you get married, I think possibly the fact that my parents got divorced when I was very young, I made sort of a vow I was going to be married for life to have attitude, although I never want to make that sort of statement. But I think that um, uh, my wife was very intelligent. I met her at the university. Uh, I was the president of the University Tennis Club. She was the prettiest girl in the club, I thought. But the thing was that she, she never, ever tried to change or inhibit my desire to do things. And I never tried to change her to something which I might have liked. So the biggest secret on the personal thing is uh, accepting who you marry, what they are, and don't try and make them in what you'd like to have them after you've married and that's not the way to do it. On the business side, I think the fundamental is they really just be, um, I suppose, really transparent and honest, uh, treat everyone the same. Uh, back in the 80s, I had a staff of over 2,500 under my control and I found that uh, it's respect and I've never put the onus of profit onto my employees that what we do is a decision made by myself and the head office and the, and the leaders of your group, but you never put the pressure down the line. Uh, and maybe that's not a good philosophy, but from our point of view, what it did was that everyone enjoys going to work. They haven't got that. If something goes wrong on a decision-making process, it's our decision, our problem, not theirs. And that gives you longevity. We've got staff now well, my secretary's been with me 46 years. That's not a bad indicator. Our chefs and our managers of business are all over 10 years now. So we've got huge longevity because that's how we treat people. And uh, we get them to enjoy what they are doing without the financial pressure of uh, whether it's a profit or loss. And we reward them for their effort as distinct from a bottom line operation. And that's just simply a philosophy I've always adopted and it's worked out well. What would be your proudest achievements? Proudest achievements. Uh, obviously, personal life, I'm very, very happy. I'm, uh, three adult kids, uh, nine grandkids under 12, which is fantastic. That's and a, a lovely wife. So that, that side's been terrific. That's plus you have to be your proudest thing in this today's environment. Business wise, I think it's the ability to be able to take an idea and a concept and grow it. I've just loved that development where you start with real estate, a little house in Florida Park to office buildings. You take a, um, a small newspaper group from one to owning all of the papers in the suburban newspapers. Temple Freight's been coming to WA Company of the Year, uh, farming from 1,000 acres to 40,000 acres. It's that growth factor. So nothing individually uh, has done that. Uh, I, suppose other, I suppose another one was that I was pro-chancellor at Medical University uh, on the Senate for nine years and pro-chancellor for three years at giving back and we do a lot with uh, charity and my eldest daughter, uh, Tanya, uh, runs the Special Olympics in Western Australia. She won the bid for the 2027 Olympic Games, Special Olympics here, which is twice as big as the Paralympics. Unfortunately, the state government didn't have an appetite for that sort of event. And otherwise it was, uh, she had the backing with all the money raised, et cetera, but just couldn't get it across the line. So I think that charity thing, which has come more into play as we've got more successful, I suppose, and 
that's reflected in our kids' attitude toward doing things. So that's been my proudest aspect is both on those three fundamentals. What's next? We spoke about this, I think three or 4,000 square metre land holding that you've got in Northbridge, which you're currently using as... as uh, 14,000. 14,000. My apologies, 14,000. <laughs> What's the what's what's next that you still want to achieve, and, and I suppose what's the future for that site? My thought is that uh, it's got a four to one plot ratio, so we can do fifty six thousand to sixty thousand square meters of space, whether it's being commercial, residential, office. It just making a difference. I see that uh, that sort of size development. I'll bring in a partner, whether it be a lend lease, a charter hall, fifty fifty sort of joint venture, and do something which is quite major. I'd love to see a, 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 a building there which is a unique uh, in that location because it deserves an attention statement to Perth and because you've got that much land with four street frontage you can really do something ultra special. I wouldn't want to see it broken up into small little fiddly things. I'd like to see not the Taj Mahal. Uh, I can't do a, a mini casino there which would have been nice I think before in the old days it had ambitions of doing a casino there but uh, that's pretty well barred by law. And uh, so I'd, I'd like to see a, a development there which uh, would rank among the best in Perth over such a big site, and you can do that. And, but I think that would be done in conjunction with a big player where our land is our equity and they'd match our equity and that would get the building out of the ground at some stage. Graham Hardy, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Rob.